this uh, this gentleman, Anthony K8ZT. We've um, we're fortunate to have him do a presentation for us before. He's one busy guy. If I could say wicked busy is uh, would be to describe him. So he's going to be doing our presentation tonight on technician. And the title of it is Technician Life Beyond Repeaters. It's chock a block full of great stuff. And without any further ado, I'm going to just hand it over to Anthony. Let him do whatever he wants to do for an uh, for uh, a uh, introduction for himself and then as long as everybody stays muted uh you can do exercises in the background and everything else and yell at the cat and it's all up to anthony take it away anthony okay well thank you very much um good evening everyone and the as the title says it's technicians life life beyond repeaters but it's not only for technicians which i'll definitely show you here in a few moments uh, my name is anthony lusky kilo eight zulu tango uh, this is my contact information, k8zt at awrl.net, and my website at k8zt.com. I'll give that again at the end here, so don't worry. What you will need is you'll need this address, tiny.cc slash btech, beyond tech, so btech, and uh, that is so you can click on all the links there in the presentation. Anytime you see this serif font italicized with a little link icon next to it, that means there's a link there with resources. If you'd prefer to have the presentation in PDF format, you can click on the little download here, but that will not be updated all the time. If you use this other link, it's constantly being updated. So the current situation, uh, just based on informal observations, most techs limit their operations to VHF and UHF repeaters with occasional simplex FM contacts. Many get their licenses but fail to get on the air or get on and burn out very quickly. Some upgrade their licenses, but many do not. Sadly, some drop out of amateur radio completely. As far as repeaters go, there's been a change, changing situation over the last 15 or so years. Uh, there's decreased activity. Uh, cell phones, texting, email, etc. have replaced the connectivity previously provided by many repeaters and something that newbies won't even know about and that's auto patching where you would have the ability to make a phone call for, through the repeater my wife and i spent a lot of time on the 80s and 90s uh, keeping in touch throughout the day via our local two meter repeater uh, even so much that when our four-year-old son when my wife got out of the car to pump gas our four-year-old son when i called k odp this is k nrc he responded very well with uh, k nrc this is k odp go ahead so he knew the lingo from listening in the car all the time and another thing that's happened is some of the repeaters have converted to uh, DMR digital repeaters uh, such as DMR, D-Star, Fusion. Um, so the repeater landscape has changed considerably. Uh, if we go back a little bit earlier, uh, novices and technician licensees on air activity typically included HF contacts in the CW subbands. They had to pass the CW test to get their license, so they had the ability to go onto these subbands and make contacts. Matter of fact, for novices, that was the primary location that you could make any contacts. Uh, tech enhancement uh, added 10 meter phone and data privileges, and the novice license went away. One of the problems with 10 meters, though, is it's highly dependent on the sunspot activity levels. Uh, it's often limited to local contacts only. It seems that some of the excitement of getting that first license may have faded along with the FCC's milling out of paper licenses. To keep the excitement, it is important the techs and other licensees in a rut get involved in a variety of amateur radio activities. Mentoring, not just licensing new hams, should be an essential part of all radio clubs. We're going to give you a choice of three paths today, depending on your situation. If you're a technician, I'm going to provide you with a number of things you can try. If you're a recently licensed or currently semi-inactive general or higher class licensee, you can do all the things I'm going to talk about with the techs, but you can do them with even more frequency and mode allocations. If you're already doing many of these things, try something new. Uh, and more importantly, consider mentoring those in groups A and B. So the current HF license privileges include HF with some frequency and mode limits. So they don't, there's no complete uh, uh, allocation of technician class privileges on any HF band. Uh, the bands that you're on have limited frequencies, uh, 80, 40, 15, and 10. On VHF, there's full privileges on six meters, two meters, and 222. 
On UHF and UP, there's full privileges. So the techs have full privileges on VHF and UHF, but limited privileges on HF. And this is just a little uh, condensed version of the AW World Band Plan showing only the technician class licenses. And if you don't remember, there's these H these HF segments with CW only privileges that were originally part of the novice class license. And those are still there. One of the other things too that you have to remember is 10, 10 meter allocation. The voice allocation is single sideband only. It does not include FM or AM. The AWRO submitted a petition to the FCC requesting an enhancement of privileges for technician class operators. It includes additional phone and data privileges on a limited number of HF bands. And you can read the full petition by clicking on the link. Um, but basically this is the current uh, tech license privileges by band and mode. And the um, proposed changes would be the following to add data in the form of RIDI and the other digital modes such as FT8, and FT4 in the current CW allocations uh, on the bands where technicians had privileges, 80, 40, and 15, to include single sideband on those three bands also. So to give techs HF that wasn't as, excuse me, that wasn't as dependent on the sunspot cycle. There are no changes to 20 or 160 in the proposal, and there's no additional allocations on the work bands, 30, 17, 12 meters, or the newest band, the 60 meters and 660, I'm sorry, um, 220 megahertz and 620 kilohertz. Uh, there's also no changes in power limits. So it's basically only in those bands that already had the original technician CW only privileges. But, when will this take effect? No idea if or when. The AWRL survey and recommendations to the board for entry level license committee met from 2016 to 17. They submitted the proposal to the FCC February of 2018. FCC posted a request for comments in March 2019 and no further action has taken place. And someone asked the, uh, the uh, AWRL New England director at the, the Vermont HamCon on the weekend and he said, he had no idea whether anything was going to be happening when or if. So that's all still up in the air. So let's not worry about what's proposed. Let's instead look at what we have available now. So there's really a couple choices that techs can do in the meantime. They can upgrade to general class and, and of course, the extra class and or they can maximize the use of current privileges that they have with their technician class license and go beyond the local UHF, VHF repeaters by exploring new modes exploring new bands, or exploring new activities. Before we get started, let's take a look at a couple of myths of the technician class license privileges. Uh, VHF and UHF repeaters are the only activity. Definitely not the case, or we wouldn't be able to do this whole talk. And there's no HF privileges. Well, we just saw that there are some CW privileges, and there are some phone privileges on 10 meters. And the next myth is only code experts can make CW contacts. And uh, that's definitely not the case. You don't need to be an expert to make contacts, and there's a lot of opportunities to make contacts. And one of the things is that the contest your clubs runs on Sunday evening. That's a great opportunity to make your first CW contacts because it's not very fast, and it's actually easier to make contacts in CW with limited CW ability in a contest where you're only copying a few characters at a time and not DX and not rag chewing for an hour. Uh, the next myth is there's no way to work DX. Well, when 10 meters opens up, you definitely can work DX, and you can also work some DX on 6 meters. Uh, 6 and 10 meters are always dead. Well, they're currently, we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle, though, so they might seem like they're dead, but there's sporadic E, which we'll talk about a little, in a few minutes. Um, there's also the myth that you can't work FT8 and FT4. Um, you can work FT8 and FT4 on 10 meters, and on 6 meters, where there's quite often activity, especially with sporadic E. And during contest weekends, on two meters, there's often FT8 or FT4 activity uh, on those bands. And then another the myth is that microwave bands are useless. Well, they're only useless if you don't have a good idea of what you can do with them. So we'll talk a little bit about that also. So let's talk about new modes. And just to summarize everything, I'm going to be going over some ideas of using single sideband on some of the bands, using CW in the, the old novice segments, uh, FT8 and FT4 on 10 and 6 meters. Um, fast scan TV is another possible new mode you might consider on UHF and 
and microwaves, and Wi-Fi, uh, which is uh, also no, known as Arden, one form of it. And that's where we use uh, Wi-Fi routers that are being used on the amateur bands with higher power and higher gain antennas. Uh, let's look at some new bands uh, that you may not have explored before. HF on single sideband on 10 meters. FM, um, I'm sorry, HFCW on 80, 40, uh, 15, and 10. VHF on 6 meters. And two, 222 megahertz. And microwave bands. As far as new activities, even just the idea of still using that same HT, FM HT you have, but trying out some simplex contacts. Uh, trying out some satellite contacts, uh, contesting, uh, then s summits on the air or parks on the air, uh, digital um, repeaters, echo link, APRS, fox hunting. So we'll go through each of these in a little more detail. Let's start with six meters as a new band to explore. Unlike 10 meters, techs have full privileges, all modes and frequencies on all of six meters. So they can use not only single sideband as they can on phone on uh, 10 meters, but they can also use FM. Um, and there are some repeaters in some areas and there's some FM simplex activity also. They can also use CW and they can use FT8 and FT4 or RIDI if they choose. Six meters can provide regional and even DX when conditions are favorable. Again, the conditions are favorable. There's a high spun sunspot activity that ionizes the F layer. But sporadic E can occur anytime. Although it's more prevalent in the spring and summer, you can get sporadic E all year long, and that can provide long distance contacts on six meters. The reason why it's called the magic band is it can go from no propagation to very distant propagation with a sporadic E kicking in very quickly. Most new HF radios already have inc include six meters as one of the bands. And for more information on HF radios, I put together a presentation on buying an amateur uh, buying a uh, amateur radio transceiver, and it covers HF, VHF, and UHF um, receivers and transceivers. So that, again, this is available, and there's a spreadsheet that goes along with this. Uh, gain antennas are easily manageable in size, but even a dipole or J-pole will work. My first six meter contact, we were living in a two two story duplex. I threw an a dipole antenna out the windows. It wasn't even stretched out as a dipole. Both ends were hanging directly down. And I made a contact to Oklahoma on uh, six meters single sideband. And that really excited me. That was back in my old technician days. Um, single sideband and digital modes are available, FT8 are most popular those are the most popular modes but there is also cw and fm um, three great resources the first two are from k5nd he has a free ebook that you can download to capture the magic of six meters he has a really good website to go along with the book and then i also have a link here for some six meter antennas from a variety of sources 10 meters uh, is the only HF phone band, as I mentioned earlier, and phone is available from 28.3 to 28.5 megahertz. But there's also digital capability uh, in the lower below that segment, also CW and RIDI, uh, FT8 can all be worked on that. Again, higher when the sunspot activity is up, uh, sporadic E though can also take place. During world, worldwide, during great con, good conditions, you can use just a few watts and talk all over the world with 10 meters. Uh, but during the sunspot lows, there's limited activity, distance, and less chance for tech voice contacts. The great news is uh, we're at the low point of the sunspot cycle. And the great news is we're going, only going up. So for the next five years, propagation should continue to get better each year, hopefully. But as I mentioned earlier, don't rule out propagation at any time due to sporadic E on 12 meters, 10 meters, or 6 meters. All those bands, novice, uh, technicians have privileges on 6 and 10. They can take advantage of that. And I have a little article that I wrote for the local newsletter here that you can read about. You skip. So let's say you decide to get on 10 meter single sideband and you do a search on the web. The first thing you're going to see if you search for a 10 meter single sideband radio is you're going to get ads for... 10 meter radios. And these are what I, from what I call, refer to as CW vendors. Nothing wrong with CW, um, CB, uh, but these CB vendors 
uh, are selling radios that they call 10 meter radios that are really more like CBs. Uh, you'll notice that in each of the ads, the word CB shows up, even though they're talking about 10 meter amateur radios. And um, they, they give you some ideas that this is a great way to get started. The problem is all these radios on this page here are AM and some of them have FM, but none of them have single sideband. So they're not usable in the 10 meter uh, technician privileges section. Um, even CB vendor 10 meter radios with single sideband, such as this Lincoln 2 here, uh, have more CW, uh, CB like features than amateur radio fe features. They're channelized, they have Roger beeps, they have squelches, they don't have an antenna tuner built in, no CAT interface for computer control, and you'd be hard pressed to put one of these onto um, FT8. You could do it, but it would not be as easy as a traditional amateur radio. 10 meter radio and they don't provide six meters or any other bands when you upgrade so it's sort of a dead end purchase because almost all real ham transceivers include 10 meters uh, you can often buy cheaper used or older equipment to get on the air than many of these uh, radios that were being advertised on the previous pages 220 UHF and microwaves I'm not gonna have a lot of time to talk about it but I just want to mention real quick um, there's lots of open space with little activity. Uh, different parts of the country have more activity than others. I think uh, you probably have more activity in Massachusetts than I do in Ohio. Um, but there is contest periods when there's much more activity on the bands. There's also some specialized modes such as the Wi-Fi we talked about earlier, fast scan TV. And there was a demonstration at the Vermont uh, HamCon last weekend of using um, motion sensors from uh, car navigation systems to communicate many, many, many miles using them at, uh, I think they're on 1200, uh, no, they're on, I can't remember, I think there were 2.2 gigahertz um, area. And I have a video, I have some information here on getting started in amateur radio with microwaves. Um, in addition to 10 meter single sideband activity and 6 meter single sideband activity, there's also VHF and UHF single sideband activity. It's mainly used for weak signal work, for contesting, and for satellites, although not all satellites are single sideband, which we'll see in a moment here. So typically, if you have a radio that has single sideband capability on 6 meters or 2 meters, the best time to try it out is during one of the four contest activity times during the year, the three AWRL contest in the, in the winter, summer, and fall, and the CQ World, uh, VHF contest during the summer are great times to try that out. Um, there's a... Uh, link here from K0NR and getting started on two meter single sideband. In addition, he also has a book called VHF Summits and More, and he does a lot of summits on the air out in Colorado with two meter single sideband. And he was speaker for our, my local club a few uh, months ago and gave a very good presentation. One big difference with two meter activity on single sideband versus FM is it usually uses horizontally polarized antennas. Although you can get by with vertical uh, antennas in a pinch, you lose some of your uh, signal strength if you're not polarized the same way as the other stations. But, I, but even then, I've made a 440 contact all the way from Ohio to Virginia uh, during a contest using my little vertical uh, antenna and their large horizontal beam at their end. As far as sampling HF, HF activity, let's say you don't have an HF receiver or an antenna capable of HF reception, you can use the free online tunable SDRs to listen to ham, single sideband, and CW QSOs worldwide. And even if you do have a radio, it's a good chance to test your radio by listening for yourself at these locations. And I put together a slideshow on using um, online SDRs, and there's also a one-page document on um, instructions on using them, and I'll just flip to that real quick here. Uh, but this document talks about how to find them on different websites. There's a list of them, including uh, on the web SDR site and the Kiwi SDR site. This is an example of a typical receiver on the web SDR site with instructions on how to use it and the keyboard shortcuts and what you want to set the, radio, the uh, receiver at to receive uh, ham radio. 
This was designed to be used with students that I work with, so there was people that didn't have any radio experience, so I wanted to make sure that it was pretty foolproof that they'd be able to hear stuff. Uh, here's an example of the Kiwi screen, and then I have some additional uh, online receivers out there, and uh, then there's also some the, the bands for the kids that I provided here. So it's a great way to listen, even if you don't have HF radio right now. CW, as I mentioned, there's there's privileges on four HF bands with CW. 80, 40, 15, and 10 are available to technicians. Most technicians, unfortunately, are not trained in CW. Um, there's also not much activity in these portions of the band. They're the very upper portions of the CW band in most cases, and most of the activity tends to be a little bit lower in the band. But during field day and other contest activity weekends, the, the CW definitely stretches up into these areas and you can make contact. You do not need to be a CW expert to make a CW contact, and I have a whole presentation called Fun with Morse, which you can view uh, by clicking the link. And this is the present, the first slide of the presentation. Um, if you're learning code, a great way is to have a buddy, uh, in, either in a class, in person, or on the air. And then there's two great uh, resources for online code courses, and you guys already know about this, but I'll just mention them anyway because in the presentation, the CW Academy and the Long Island CW Online Classes are two great resources for learning CW. Digital modes include FT8 and FT4. Uh, they're the fastest growing amateur radio modes. They're good with very weak signals, poor antennas, poor propagation conditions, etc. Something that may, may be very common for a lot of technician operators. Let's say you don't have a very good antenna up. Maybe you only have an indoor antenna. With a weak signal on 10 meters, it might be difficult to make voice contacts, but making FT8 or FT4 contacts may be very, very easy to do. It's only a few years old and highly likely that there'll be many more similar modes which will be available as they develop. And this is a link to a presentation on FT8 and FT4, which I think I already did. I think that's the presentation I did for your club already. Uh, Simplex FM. It, it, just getting off the repeater occasionally and trying out some Simplex FM. If you have a two meter radio that does FM, set it to 146.520, which is the national two meter calling frequency for Simplex. And you'll be surprised how much activity is there. I have a radio that, that has two bands on it and I keep it in the shack here and I always ha have one of them set to the Simplex frequency. A couple weekends ago, I heard someone calling uh, CQ, CQ for uh, parks on the air, and he was working from a park on the air uh, on 2 meter FM. So I was able to work him on 2 meter simplex and uh, had a real, real good time. It's a great way to start experimenting with ex external antennas. Take that rubber duck off, attach a, a little bit of a gain antenna to it, and see how much better your range can be on simplex uh, when you have a much better antenna. You can also Try out a small amplifier to go along with your HT or your mobile radio. Many local clubs and organizations hold two meter FM simplex contests on a regular basis, and they're often grid square based. We have one for our local club, and we use the six letter, uh, the six digit grid squares. So those last two letters count as a multiplier. So it's a good opportunity just to move it a short distance and be able to be uh, come a new multiplier. And I have a video available on uh, doing FM simplex actually multiple videos. One of the things you need to know about uh, simplex though is you need to choose the right frequencies and you don't want to choose frequencies that are A in the single sideband portion of the band, B in the repeater portion of the band, or especially important not in the satellite portion of the band. So what I've done here is I've listed out the two meter simplex uh, recognized or recommended frequencies and you notice the different parts of the country have different uh, channelizations. So some places use a 15 uh, kilohertz uh, separation, which means they can squeeze in more frequencies. Other places use a 20, so they can spread them out a little bit further. Um, most of the station, most of the places east of the Mississippi use 15, with the exception of Alabama and Michigan. Um, so you can pick out the frequencies on this little chart. The ones in green are available on both. So no matter which. Split, uh, spacing you're using, that's a simplex frequency on both of them. And the one in red, of course, is the national calling simplex frequency for two meters. 
Let's talk a little bit about satellites in space. With rare exception of a few older HF satellites, almost all satellite privileges are available to technicians. Um, there's five main types of satellite and space communication. Uh, low Earth orbit FM-based satellites, low Earth linear transponder satellites, which are single sideband and or CW, higher orbit linear transponders, which are mainly single sub sideband and CW, geosynchronous orbit satellites. There is currently none over the United States. There's one over Europe and Africa, but none currently over the U.S. And then the space station uses FM. Um, when it goes over and it also has some data modes that it uses. So those are five different ways that you can make space contacts. We're going to concentrate on the first one though, the low earth orbit FM based satellites for a couple reasons. One, they're easier to use. The Doppler shift is very minor and it can be easily adjusted by uh, just changing your channel slightly. Um, you can often use existing dual band HTs or other FM radios that you might already have. Compact, inexpensive gain antennas are, are small and manageable and allow you to work these satellites. Uh, and it's a great area to explore with youth operators. And there's a whole new organization starting up called Youth, youth on Satellite Activity, YOSA. Uh, you may have heard of YOTA, Youth on the Air. Uh, this is a new concept that's being worked on by a couple of people right now. So Steve, uh, Sean uh, Cutso, uh KX9X, has a great series of blog postings on everything you really need to know about satellites. And then he also has corresponding YouTubes uh, to go along with them. And this is Sean out in the field in Wisconsin. I think where he's at in this particular picture here. Um, basically, to operate these low Earth orbit FM satellites, you need a dual band, 2-meter, two, two 440 FM HT or mobile radio, or you can use other radios that have d uh, both 440 and 2 meters in them, uh, such as the Yesu FT991, the small portable uh, eight, um, FT818. I actually have the older model, the 817, and that's what I actually use for my satellite um, work. Uh, the ICOM 705, the new radio that just came out is great. The 7100 from ICOM, um, the 9700 all have uh, dual band um, capability with uh, VHF and UHF to be able to work these FM satellites. As far as an antenna, I have two commercial antennas here, but then I have a lot of DIY antennas, including the VE2ZAZ Aero style, which is basically a clone of the Aero antenna that you do yourself. And then the $4 ham radio satellite antenna, uh, which you can put together, or you can even use the modified version of it. Um, one of the things about satellite operations that's a little bit different than all the other operations is you need to know where the satellite's at, and it's predictable. And in the olden days, you had to download software, and you had to listen on the radio to get the Keplerian elements uh, uploaded into your software, and then you could calculate when the sat satellites were going to be overhead. Now there's sites available online where you can simply put in your location and put in the satellites you want to track, and it'll track them for you on the screen and give you printouts to tell you the time that they're available. I use the N2YO site a lot, and it's that's a great way to uh, track satellites. And this is a picture of it here tracking. I think this, I think that's this, actually the shuttle. No, that's uh, Sudas that one uh, one C. Uh, contesting is another area to explore, and as I said earlier, you can do a two meter and four forty contest. There's also contests that on HF that include. 10 meters, of course, plus the CW portions of the other bands are also available for contesting. So there's a possibility of three different types of contesting you can get involved with with the technician class license. And I did a presentation uh, for an AWR webinar on November 3rd on getting started in contesting, an introduction to amateur radio contesting that you can watch the recording of by clicking on the link, or you can view the slideshow by clicking on the other link. Uh, other activities that you can try, uh, summits on the air, and it's not just mountains, it's any high spot. So I'm sure that, well, you guys have mountains in, in Massachusetts much more than we have here, but the high spot can be 1,500 feet like it is here in Ohio, or it can be 120 feet like it is in Florida, or it can be, what's the highest peak in Massachusetts? I don't know off the top of my head. Is it, Mount, let's see, Mount Washington is in New Hampshire. I forget which big peak you oh, have. Oh, Greylock. Greylock, that's it. 
Um, so that's one activity. Another one is parks on the air. And this isn't just national parks. This is state parks also. And as I said earlier, there's nothing that stops you from doing an operation on FM uh, two meters or single sideband six meters or whatever you like to do. So these are great ways to get out and uh, do things in nature. Digital FM modes for VHF, such as DMR, D-Star, System Fusion, are all new ways that uh, you can expand your repeater activity. And most of these repeaters have inner backbone interconnections that allow you to talk far distances between them by using a internet backbone to connect different uh, digital repeaters. If you don't have a digital repeater really close to you, you can also get a hotspot and use that. So there's a lot of experimentation available there with DMR. Um, Echo Link is another type of connection that uses internet as part of the, the pathway. Uh, APRS, Automatic Packet Reporting System, is a way to track uh, your vehicle or your person if, you're, if you have an APRS when you're going out in, uh, on your body. But it's a great way for organizing things such as parades and other activities where you need to track vehicles. Fox hunting doesn't require any license if you're hunting. The only license required is the person that's doing the fox, the transmitting. So it's a great activity for both technicians and for unlicensed uh, uh, people that are interested in radio. And it's also known as hidden transmitter hunts, direction finding, etc. And don't forget the technical end of things, construction, uh, kits, home brewing, designing antennas. These are all areas that you can get involved with um, in amateur radio that you might not be doing now. One of the most important things to all these is I gave a little talk tonight, but I'm not going to be here next week or next day, tomorrow when you think have some more ideas. Although, please feel free to email me if you have questions. But one of the greatest things you can do is find an Elmer. An Elmer is someone that can answer the, help you answer the questions that you have about these new modes, about these new bands, about these uh, new op operating th um, styles that you might want to pursue. And where do you find an Elmer? Well, the, probably the best place to look is at the club that you belong to. Uh, and if you don't belong to a club, think about joining a club. Here's some list of clubs available. Lots of old timers are more than happy to help newcomers, and many clubs have formal Elmering programs. If your club doesn't have one, you might want to consider setting one up. Nowadays, you might find your Elmer online. There are lots of websites and mailing lists that are geared towards helping people become better amateur radio operators. And one fallacy is that you can only have one Elmer. In fact, it's great to have more than one Elmer because different Elmers can help you with different uh, aspects of amateur radio. You might have an antenna, antenna Elmer who's great with antennas and maybe a, that, that digital person that can help you out with setting up digital modes. So look for this Elmer and not Elmer FUD when you're looking for your Elmer. Um, four presentations that I put together recently. Actually, I put um, these together mainly for the two classes I just got done with. I taught a technician class in the fall and a general class license uh, these last two months. So I put together a session called Buying an Amateur Radio Transceiver that covers HF, VHF, and UHF equipment, handhelds, base stations, mobiles, etc. And there's also a corresponding spreadsheet that goes along with it. And I'll bring that up in a second. There's also one on setting up your VHF, UHF station, setting up your HF station. And the newest uh, program I just put together is this one called uh, 100. That's got a killer title that I might need to shorten here. And I got the wrong link. Let's try that again. Okay, here we go. Three stations for 100 plus mile contacts with a tech class license. So it basically fills in a little bit more material on some of the three on three of the things we talked about today. And that is a CW operation on 80 or 40 uh, digital operation on 10 meters of uh, FT8 and low earth uh, FM satellites. And this is available again at this link tiny.cc slash 100 tech. And this is the one I'm buying a amateur radio transceiver. And then this is the corresponding spreadsheet that goes with it. And I'm, I'll give you all these links here in a moment. But this is the spreadsheet listing of radios. And I have both current and 
used radios, and I've been putting links in for them. Um, I've also put together this HF rig comparison matrix for radios that are current or been in production within the last five years, and it just compares some of the features and prices and different items on some radios that are out there that you might find useful when you look shopping for an HF radio. I'm putting together the same thing for mobile VHF UHF radios, uh, but I'm still filling that in. And this changes a little bit faster than HF radios, and I haven't got around to an HT one yet because it's the fastest changing of them. Um, again, the link for today's presentation is tiny.cc slash btech. This is my contact information. And then I put together recently a list of all of the presentations I've done in the last year. Um, and I have some of them are listed more than once, but I have slideshows for them all. And then I have videos for some of them that have been recorded by various organizations. Some of them are still to come uh, on the 13th and 14th for the QSO Today Expo. I'm doing three sessions, one, um, uh, one on uh, youth and amateur radio, one on uh, choosing your ideal call sign. And I forget the third one. The third one is on the state Q QSO party challenge. I'm also doing a webinar this coming next this uh, following Tuesday uh, for the AWR on the same topic I'm doing tonight. So you got it ahead of time on them. But this is available at tiny.cc slash k8zt dash p. And it gives you links to all my slideshows. So that's the end of the presentation. I'll leave this on the screen for just a few seconds if you need to copy that link. And I will take questions and comments. I got to I got to say I get more impressed every time I uh, uh, I hear from you I hear you or or, or visit your website. Um, I was going to ask you if you were going to do one on QRP as one of your future ones, but I and I and I had searched and I didn't see anything. But on that uh, that breakdown that you just had, uh, you do have a you have one on QRP. Yes, I gave that about probably it's probably about two or three years old. I presented that to a club in the Youngstown, Ohio area live when back when we still did meetings in person and uh it needs a little bit of updating but it's it, there is one on qrp there and i will be tweaking that a little more over the, over the next time i give it also i was asked to uh someone saw my slide with my with the train on it my trainman's outfit and they said they wanted to program they asked me if i had a program on combining amateur radio and railroads so i'm putting together a program that'll be available by early summer uh, combining trains and railroads, what it's going to do is basically look at the the trips my wife and I take for field day. We always travel to a state that doesn't have very much field day activity. We've operated from Maine, uh, Vermont, uh, Delaware, West Virginia a number of times, Montana. And each trip we've also included some sort of train activity, uh, whether it's been uh, after our trip to Maine going down to Scranton to the steam town or uh, going to Montana on the train to operate for field day or traveling on multiple trains in West Virginia when we were down there. So I'll be putting that together. So that'll be coming out early this summer. I've started writing it, but I'm not finished with it by any means yet. We'll look forward to that. I remember Marty asking you that question. So maybe he's the guy that got that uh, rolling. I don't know. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay, good. So that means that means that you're already on the hook to uh, well, when, once you get it, once you get it rolling, we'd love to have you have you scheduled. Yes, I, I think it was Marty that asked me. I, I'm not positive, but I, but I think that's who asked me to do that. I get a lot of requests, so sometimes I forget the names involved with them. So, um, questions. Uh, Eddie, my question, can you copy me? Yes. Okay. My question is, you mentioned when you, you go out to Montana, uh, do field day, uh, you go out by train. I've taken the uh, Empire Builder a few times across the country and uh, been to Montana by, by road quite a few times. Uh, when you go, uh, what do you do? Just get off and rent a, a space in a, in a hotel or a motel? Yeah, we, we, went, to, we went to East Glacier. And we uh, there's some cabins there's some cabins about a half a mile north of the station, and uh, we rented a car. Uh, the people with the motel were not with the cabins were nice enough to drive down and pick us up at the train station, bringing us back to the cabins because we didn't have the car yet. And then we traveled around Glacier for a couple of days. We stayed there for I think four days in the Glacier, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we left on Monday back on the train again. 
After that, we went to Portland. Then we went down the coast to Los Angeles. Uh, from Los, we spent a couple days in Los Angeles with some friends. Then from Los Angeles to New Orleans, New Orleans back to Atlanta, Atlanta to Washington D.C., and then back to Cleveland. Uh, we were on the road for four, 14 days. We had a rail pass. We were in uh, we were in coach until Montana, and then after that, we had a roomette. Yeah, I, you can't beat uh, uh, can't beat traveling that way. And try the Canadian via sometime across the uh, across Canada. Yeah, we'd love to do that one. Just just prepare, be prepared to be late. It's never on you, time. You know, everyone told us we were going to be late on all these trips we took, and we were only delayed one time, and that was coming out of Los Angeles. We we were coming out of Los Angeles on July fourth. And we got to Palm Springs, and there was a switch that needed set that there was was a problem with, and then we had to wait a little while until they came out and took care of that. But other than that, we uh, <laughs> we were pretty good the whole way through. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Great way to go. Other questions, or if you have any experiences similar, any suggestions for other operators on activities to try? Please go you know, ahead. You know, when you you mentioned something about uh, the, uh, the you know two meter FM simplex and and we have a, we actually have a simplex frequency that we use pretty regularly and it's uh, one it's uh, one forty six five three five which is just up from five two. And what and, do we call uh, that pie? <laughs> these guys <laughs> named it. These guys named it the pie channel. So. <laughs> anyways anyways we have a lot no, that of that should be 146 that should be 140 146 314 i know i know <laughs> but but we also the thing is we also have a um, there's a group now and this is kind of a, a uh, something that's taken place because of the uh, uh activities you know from the pandemic is that now there's a two meters uh uh, single sideband net that has started up on Monday evenings and they've got some great, they have like 15 people ordinarily checking in and I, and then they're, they're going through the whole thing about building antennas and coming up with uh, horizontally polarized ones. And, and, uh, in, and uh, there's also a, two, a six meter FM net, which has been around for quite a while with this group. So, uh, you know, we, we have, there's a lot of activities that people of any, any license class can get involved with here that we, we try to help. The, 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 those are all great. Uh, one other thing I heard about, this was in the Detroit area. They do something called a repeater pub crawl. They don't. There's no pubs involved in it, but it's like a pub crawl. Um, on Friday evenings, they designate, I think it's five to eight repeaters, and everyone moves from repeater A to repeater B, to, and they move around like that. And the whole idea is to try out different repeaters to see whether you can hit a repeater from your area. Uh, to program in the, the, the tones you need and the splits you need and everything. So in case of you need to switch to another repeater, uh, you're familiar with the repeaters in your area. So they call it a repeater pub crawl. It sounds like a great idea. And I, I, think think you get to have, I think you get to have uh, refreshments on your own at home. You don't get I, to do those while you're out doing the repeaters, but you can have those while you're at home. I was going to say you could, you could probably uh, provide your own refreshments of whatever type you wanted. That's great. That's great. And... Um, uh, you know, when you talked about six meter, I had been licensed for a lot of years. Actually, I just hit my 59th anniversary yesterday of being licensed, but yet I had been licensed for many years and never gotten on six meters. And when ICOM came out with their ICOM 706, it was something similar to what you were talking about. I strung yes. up a dipole and I worked a couple of stations out in the Midwest and I said, Hey, this six meter band is pretty wild. And it wasn't during a peak of the sunspot cycle or anything. It was strictly some sporadic E. And so I, I, I realized right away that uh, you could have a lot of fun on six meters. And yeah, maybe it's quiet a lot of the time, but there's you got to be there at the right time. Yes. The, and, and, you know, we're coming up on the season when you're going to start seeing more um, more seasonal uh, F skip. So let me bring this up real quick here. Let me just show the screen again here. Um, This is the article I put together for our newsletter on six meter. I mean, on um, e skip. But this is an example of e skip on six meter on six meters during a a, a big opening. Uh, this is uh, my station with uh, six meters um, on FT eight. 
uh, showing it on PSK re, uh, repeat reporter. Um, again, I'm running five watts and you're seeing activity all over this, the country here. And then here's some of my information on the contacts I work. And you notice this little chart here shows a big up swing in six meters during June. Part of that's e skip, but also another part of that is because that's when the VHF uh, UHF contest by the AWRL is. Uh, the, it's usually the second week, the first weekend in June, I think, or the first or second weekend, I can't remember which. And that's when there's a lot of activity typically on six meters. So you can see that I'm making six meter, 10 meter, and 12 meter contacts all via e skip when the sunspots were very low. This is a couple of years ago, two years ago, uh, May, May 2018 through July of 2019, um, all five watts. And this is the DX that I worked on those bands. So again, this would all be available to technician with the exception of the 12 meter contacts. Um, but all these 10 meter contacts, these are almost all e-skip contacts. They're not really F uh, ionization contacts because the sunspot numbers were very low during the times that I made these. Anthony, what was the, in the antenna you're using for those? Was it um, you mobile or were you at home or base? I was at home. Uh, at home, I have a three three element uh, beam on six meters at fifty foot. It's actually part of my antenna. My antenna that I have is a um, a Sumner XP seven o eight. I think it is seven. No, sorry, five o eight. And it's got it's a it's a um, log Yagi, uh, but it has effectiveness of three elements on six meters. So it's not a six meter only dedicated antenna. It's mixed in with my HF antenna. So it's not the best six meter antenna, but it works um, very well. But I've made a lot of six meter contacts with just the dipole on, on uh, both the e skip and on F. And what were you working for a rig? Um, that was with my uh, my um, Elcraft K3S running at five watts. Now, can and, you suggest anything? I'm sorry. Can you suggest anything from mobile use for a six meter? Antenna? Well, right now um, there's there's a couple of possibilities. Um, things such as like a, the the um, Yesu 891, uh, which is a HF and six meter portable, um, under eight hundred dollars new. Uh, it's it, hundred watts on. Uh, on those bands, uh, the some of the older radios like the 706, uh, the 857 from Yesu, those are all possibilities. Let me bring up the uh, share share here a second. So on my spreadsheet that for the radio transceivers. Need to shrink this back down again. There we go. Um, on this HF rig matrix, you'll see that all of these radios that have the check box, check mark on them have six meters included. So most of these radios, with the exception of just a few, these single band radios, of course, don't have it. And um, you know, this may be. I don't remember whether the 1200 has it or not. Um, off the top of my head. And even like these little Zygus, um, the, the G90 has uh, six meters on it. That's a but that's a under five hundred dollar radio new for you can pick them up for four ninety nine. I've seen them as low as three is three three ninety uh, new for that particular radio. And the eight the X five one oh five is a more of a portable version of the same thing, but it's the same basic guts in it. It's just a little bit different shape and this has a built-in battery um, and it's an HF radio with six meters mm. this is a this is a, a little power radio this is a five watt radio the uh, the 90 is a 20 watt radio but uh, some of these like the Yesu uh, 891 let me get the right spot here come on I'm sorry, why is the 891 not on this list here? Ah, well, there it is. I wasn't rolled up far enough. So the 891 is a little portable. It covers all the HF bands and six meters. 
and it's not very big, so it'd be a great radio for portable use. I'm pretty sure it's 100 watts on 6. I know it's 100 watts on the other HF bands. I think it's 100 watts on 6 also. Yes, any it is. Any ideas on a mobile antenna? Um, for 6 meters? To, well, traditionally, when people work single sideband on 6 meters, they use a horizontally polarized antenna. Um, the, the antenna that was popular a few years back when 6 meters was more popular in mobile was called a squalo. And I don't know if anyone makes a commercial squalo right now, but it's something you can put together. Um, I have a I have a G ninety, and I don't do not believe it does six meters. Yeah, the G ninety. Yes, the G ninety does not. I guess I'm sorry, but this is an example of a squalo. Mm -hmm. I had a halo. You could get. You could again. You're not gonna. You're gonna lose some some signal. But when you're talking about long distances in six. Uh, it doesn't really matter about polarization at that point in time. So when you're doing point to point, the polarization is important. But when you start doing e skip, it gets scattered anyway. So your vertical mobile antenna would be fine. This is more if you're doing local stuff point to point. I purchased a halo antenna for six meters, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, they were still available uh, that I used on my van. Also yeah. had a uh, vertical on the roof for six meter FM, and it worked quite well. I mean, considering it's only what eight, nine, ten feet off the ground, yes, it worked quite successfully. We have uh, plans on our uh, on our radio club website for a squalos made out of old lawn chairs. They make a pretty good uh, squalo. You know, I can't remember the the, the model of this, but someone might be able to remember remind me here there was an icom um series that were vertical um i thought it was the five maybe it's the 502 there it is so this is this is the two, the 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 um radio right here that i had my first six one of my first six meter radios and it had a pull-up antenna on it and my brother and i were listening we were driving in his truck and we were listening and we heard you know working local stations and we heard someone far away and they not very well though so we got out and just put it on the roof on the hood of his truck so we had a ground plane pulled up the antenna and made a contact in new hampshire from here in ohio I, that, I think this is three. I think these were three watts. I can't remember what they were. They had battery pack built into them. I think they were three watts. So when six opens, um, you don't need a lot of power. You don't need a lot of antenna to make contacts. And I wouldn't worry too much about the horizontal versus polar pol, um, vertical polarization on six if you're making long distance contacts because it doesn't matter at that point in time. It's just like any other HF. It acts more like an HF band at that point. When you're doing point to point, it helps to have the same polarization. Hey, Anthony, this is Rick N1DC. Great yes. presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just relay an experience I had on six meters last year. I've been a ham since 1968, and my first six meter contact took place last year in the uh, ARRL VHF contest. Sure. And I don't have a six meter antenna. And I said to myself, I've got a couple of options. I could try my 160 meter inverted L, which didn't work very well. And then I decided just to directly drive my high gain Explorer 14 four element Yagi, which is designed for 10, 15, and 20. And much to my surprise, I was able to load it at less than two to one SWR on six meters. And I worked over 200 contacts on CW. So my, my moral of the story is try what you have. You'd be surprised what might happen. Yes, my, actually my, uh, when I put up my first tower, I had a 30 foot uh, tower with a 10 meter beam on it. And that's when that, that I tried that on six with an antenna tuner, it worked great. And I worked probably my first 40 states on six meters with a 10 meter beam. Uh, it wasn't even you know, the right beam for the band, but uh, it did work. And the other thing that a lot of people will do is uh, you might've seen the J poles that a lot of people build for VHF and UHF. You can also build those for six meters. So it's a good portable antenna if you're going out in the field and you want something simple to carry. You can make a J-pole with twin lead or you can make a J-pole with uh, aluminum if you want and you can get by with using something like that also. And you know, the whole idea on trying, just trying it, like what Rick just said there, the um, one of the locals 
fellows here in Massachusetts that uh, goes up to St. Pierre every year, Eric KV1J. Uh, he goes up there and he activates all the bands. And uh, when, you know, he was on for, he was on six meters operating. And just for the heck of it, I loaded up my 160 meter inverted L and uh, we had a, had a great contact. So it's, it's like, if you don't try it, you're never going to know. Yeah, my R5 loads up pretty nicely on six. Which I yeah, that's a good example right there. Yeah, which I think I got from you, Pi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. You know, I've, okay. I've, I worked KV1J on, on when he was on FP, uh, when, he, when he was there. I didn't work him. Yes, I did work him on six. I worked him on uh, 50.314, six meter FT8 on uh, in 2018. I worked them on uh, 10 meters single sideband. Yeah, he's all over the place up there. He activates yep. every band, every mode. You know, if you just yeah. if you just have any kind of radio that has six meters and you put together a little dipole and get on FT8, you have no problem making contacts. So you can combine two of the things we talked about: a new mode and a new uh, band at the same time. This is a uh, example of the Kiwi uh, software defined on radios I was talking about. The one I p grabbed off the list here is this. Um, I may grab another one here and go back and grab a different one. But these are the list of, these are in all these different places so you can pick the one you want. And then you can use it to listen to uh, But you can also put the frequency in this way, so let's just... Helps if you put the right number of digits in. This particular one is pretty tricky. They'll allow you to listen to people at different points, and you can even listen to yourself from a distance. A lot of people, we have a couple of people in our radio club who have a lot of local noise, so they can't really operate on 160. But what they do is they set up receiving on a different one in the local area here, and they listen on that, and then they can transmit on their transceiver, and they can work 160 with the bad noise at their house. One person lives right next to an AM broadcast station. Anthony, uh, this yes. is in one VH. Uh, we had a conversation during our Saturday morning net with a new tech uh, licensee, and his question, his comment was, "Why well, every time I get on, the band's dead. There's no activity." And so we were taking them through some things to help generate activity and find it, be it nets, um, spotting networks. Do you have a presentation that kind of addresses that for the new guy? He just turns on his radio, how to find activity. I haven't put anything together like that, but I know myself, uh, this is a case of, you know, the Elm, how much an Elmer can help. When I got my first HF radio back in the early 1980s, I would listen on 10 meters all night long. And then I would listen on 80 during the day. I didn't know, I didn't realize I was listening at the wrong time on the wrong band. So even though uh, that, that even makes it harder if you listen on the wrong band at the wrong time. So that's one thing, you know, the prop idea of propagation. The other big thing too is with the spotting networks we have available now. That's a great way, you know, just take a look at some of the DX spotting networks and see where where the stations are at on the band uh, to get started that way. Nets are a good way to get started. Although I've not been a, a a big HF net person, I've done a few. What our local club started recently is um, we used to have a we have a VHF with two meter four forty net on Monday even Monday after Monday evenings, which is our usual club time. And we used to have a 10 meter net after it. And the 
number of people checking in had really dropped off. So we decided to instead do what we call band expiration net. On the first Monday of the month, we do six meters. On the second Monday of the month, we do 10 meters. And both those are available to technicians, of course. On the third Monday of the month, we do 40 meters. And we encourage technicians to listen to us if, you know, because they can't connect on that. And on the fourth Monday of the month, we use 80 meters. And this was great because it got a lot of people on new bands that they weren't operating on, a lot of club members who just never operated on particular bands. And then on the fifth Monday of the month, if it's a winter time, we do 160, which got a lot of people on a new band for the first time. During the summer, we either choose one of the, the work bands like 17 or 12, and we operate that. So the whole idea of this band expiration that I know of at least a, a half a dozen people in our club that have put up new antennas in the last couple of months to be able to get onto the Explorer net. Uh, that, that sounds like an interesting concept there. The other thing I was going to ask is if you had a lot of um, new ham operators are antenna challenged or in HOAs, uh, do you have anything that points them to how to get around that, some stealthy antennas, especially if you're just using the, the UHF, VHF environment? Well, you know, I've been using a lot of the – a lot of the times when I do field day and portable operations, I use an end fed um, half wave or I use a random end fed uh, tuned with my antenna tuner. And that way I'm just using real thin, thin black wire. There's no place I couldn't put that up that, I, that, that people would be able to see it. You know, so that's always an option to getting an antenna outside. But attic antennas, when I was living in a duplex, I couldn't put anything up. And I just went up into the attic and it was just a standard wood, wood framed um uh, duplex and I just ran a 40 meter dipole in there and it worked great. I was up the second story. I just tacked it on the top beam running across the middle of the, the attic and ran it that way. Um, as far as portability goes, the magnetic loop antennas work well, but you're constantly retuning them. But if you want to do FT8 and FT4, they, they work great because once you get it tuned for that band, you don't have to move it. So magnetic loops can be really easy to set up and they're also portable and they don't have to be up high in the sky. So magnetic loops can work out well that way, but I would, I would suggest people first try out some, you know, like either uh, end fed or dipoles because you can make them stealthy and cheap. You know, that's the whole thing. You're, you're not really investing a lot of money. When I do portable operations, I don't depend on trees. So I usually bring a collapsible uh, seven meter fiberglass fishing pole. And then I can just stretch either an inverted V shape an end fed I can wrap it around there if I want to get some, you know, take up a little bit of the space and use that with a good antenna tuner and had a lot of success. Or you can cut it for the band and have it resident so you don't have to worry about an antenna tuner. I'm experimenting with an antenna that's a magnetic uh, resonance antenna as opposed to the electronic resonance antenna. It's the Comptana, and I'm still not satisfied that i have it working properly so i'm still experimenting with that but it's very very portable it's about the size of a four inch pvc pipe about six about four foot long so it's very compact and it'd be very good for hiding because you could put it on your roof and it would look just like a you could have it as a in a stack uh um an exhaust pipe that you would normally have for your hot water heater so you there's no way they would be able to tell it was an antenna even up on the top of a roof but i'm still experimenting with that but it's, it's called Comptan. I'll put the link in the. I think that's the sheets that you had with all of the, uh, with all of the link information are absolutely uh, uh, fantastic. So oh, I'm looking forward to spending some time after this uh, going through them, especially the, those ones that you built uh, specifically for the people who have just recently gotten licensed with radios to buy and, uh, uh, you know, suggestions and pricing and everything else. That's, that looks, look great. You know what? I have a link here for antennas that, let me share this link. Um, let me just bring up the uh, share here again. This is part of the setting up your um, HF station. So in here I have, you know, typical station set up and then I have the coax going outside and I have a dipole and then I have the links for setting up a dipole. But I also have a link here for, um, okay, where's it at? Here we go. It's tiny.cc slash port Anna. I'm sorry, port ant. Port ant. 
P-O-R-T-A-N-T. It's right here. If you can see it, Port Ant. Um, this was originally designed for field day last year because people were, had to do field day on their own for the first time. A lot of people were doing their field day without the club. So I put together, we, that's why it's called portable antennas because it was originally set up for what people could do during field day. It talks about the pros and cons of different types of antennas. It has a whole section on each of the different antennas with links. Uh, so here's dipoles, resident dipoles, non-resident dipoles, resident, non-resident, end fed antennas. Uh, inverted V's and slopers, verticals, both commercial and homemade, uh, some beams, and so forth. And that's available at port, tiny.cc port ant. This is what I used for field day two years. Um, I took one of these MFJ spider, I'm sorry, cobweb antennas. And it's basically a set of dipoles for 2017, 15, 12, and 10 on a, that looks sort of like a hex beam, but it's not a hex beam. It's not directional, so you don't need to rotate it. And I modified it so I could have a portable operation. I, I, I modified the uh, spreaders. But this is the way the wire attaches. And you could easily homebrew one of these also, just using PVC as I did here with the wires on it. And what happens then is it's a, This is what it looks like when it's uh, and these are oh let's see I can't remember how long these are I think they're seven no they're not seven foot I think they're five foot so I think this is ten foot across if I remember correctly or twelve feet across. Now I've got now I've got more stuff to explore. That's that. What, that's what that looks like quite a resource. Yeah, and uh, that's it. That's in the setting up your uh, HF station. Mm -hmm. The link to that. And you know, when Marty asked that question about uh, some of the newer people, we of course we we try to uh, encourage everyone to to get the maximum that they can out of the hobby and and uh, uh, explore things on HF. But on VHF, you know, uh, for some of the for some of the new people. Uh, a lot of people get a lot out of IRLP and Echolink, and uh, I mean, there's there's all all, all kinds of whoop, there's all all kinds of uh, directions that they can go with that too. Yeah, and um, my assistant section manager, section youth coordinator for Ohio, she's a seventh grade young lady, and she does a lot of uh, IRLP and, and Echolink in addition to her HF stuff. She's an extra class hand, but she still can, likes to connect with a lot of youth going that route because there's a lot more youth out there. Um, but Katie's uh, Katie does a lot more than that than I do. The repeater that we have a we have a net on every Saturday morning on a on a local repeater, and it's a it's a full fledged repeater that has uh, all uh, the digital modes and everything else. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they've. Uh, been, been mentioning on the uh, their Facebook page, and I and I had some communication the other day, that it sounds as though within the next few weeks they may be active again on IRLP on Echolink. So then some of the people that we have that uh, are part of our club that are stretched out in different parts of the country, they might even be able to check in with us on our Saturday morning nets through that through that uh, means. You know we have um, we are we have set up a link, and I'm I'm not sure when the club has set it up, so I don't know the details of how it works. But we have a link set up so that you can listen to our repeater online, even though we don't have an internet connection for the repeater. Uh, through um, let me bring it up here real quick. I don't remember the details. I just put together an article for our newsletter on it.
drag this over here. Okay, so uh, this is an article for our local for our local newsletter, and um, broadcast the fi. So when you're not local or if you don't have a radio with you, you can listen to our repeater. There's like a 10 second delay. Um, and I think this is, I don't know how this is set up, but uh, one of the club members has it set up so that he's monitoring the repeater and feeding it into Broadcastify. And they just host it and it's, it's free. And you can um, listen to the radio that way. So we have that. And then for our band exploration net, we're asking them to use the Kiwi radio so they can listen to us. That was something I had never heard of. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned a lot. Yeah, that's, I had forgot about, forgotten about it, and I'm sure a lot of our members did. That's why I wrote the article for the newsletter so that they would see that. Um, but that's one of the one of the big things. The other thing that we're thinking about doing, and um, this is a follow up to the two classes we taught, we're thinking about doing a three weekend uh, get on the air uh, type of classes. Not really classes, but just uh, online Zoom, so that we can get people on the air with their radios, help programming, help set things up of that nature. So we'll follow up a couple months after they finish their license exams because we don't have direct contact with the people right now during the pandemic. Um, but I've set up a couple people. I set up a FT8, FT4 station for someone uh, all just using remote connectivity uh, with Chrome desktop, set up all the software and everything for them. They connected the wires together and I got them on the air. It was an older gentleman who wasn't real computer literate, but I've been doing a lot of setting that up and a lot of setting up N1MM and other contesting software before contests for people. So we've we've started this whole idea of having online Elmering available through our club so that we can help you out with things uh, during the pandemic. And I'm sort of like the software person. We have another person that does antenna issues and we have another person that does DMR and we have another person that does other things. But uh, so I get all the calls when their software is not working properly. Usually things like I just, I was running N1MM, I just worked 250 contacts and I lost everything. And then I just go on and find it and they read it and lose it. They just thought they did. Well, thank Good you all. Nicholas Jackson. <laughs> thank you very much, Anthony. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to having you back again sometime. 73. 7-3, thank, thank you. you.